are technical and write code of some variety. Okay, good. At least a third of you, because um, oh, this is a constant sort of um, autoplay. Um, that's good because this is a demo, and what Mortar is is a, a tool that software engineers and data scientists use. So the interface to this demo is code. Um, I'm going to be writing a lot of code, be looking at code, and if that's not interesting to you, I'm going to try to keep coming back up to why it matters and why this is interesting. But your eyes might glaze over a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, so, without further excuses, um, how can I get that out of the way? Um, so what Mortar is, is a platform, as I said, for, for data scientists and engineers to use to process very large volumes of data. And what I mean by process is anything from like ETL, so joining data sets, um, cleansing, doing entity dis disambiguation, machine learning, building recommender systems, any sort of uh, applying calculations to very large data sets. And the reason I say large data sets is because Mortar is built on top of Hadoop, which is a parallelized system for, for executing on many machines at once. If you don't need parallelization, there is some cognitive overhead and some um, tooling overhead that comes with that that you're probably not going to want. So you could use Mortar for very small data sets. It's probably not the right thing. All right. Our mission is to democratize data development. So that has implications for how we price Mortar. It has implications for, um, for our dedication to open source and making available the things that we do as much as possible. And it also has implications for, how, for our focus as a company. So taking this very hard domain, which is working with large volumes of data in a parallelized way, and making it as straightforward and simple and fast as possible. And so if you're, if you're you know, not technical, some of, the, some of the things that I'd like to, you know, that, that hopefully you would come away with if you were technical, are um, what we're trying to do, and what I think we're, we've been pretty successful doing, is make it so easy to work with large volumes of data that it almost becomes transparent that there are large volume, vo volumes. The, the programming paradigms are very, very simple. Your iteration speed is incredibly fast. And so I'm gonna show you how that works. Um, before I do that, okay, so what are the, what are the sort of domains that, that Mortar could be used for? This is supposed to indicate a graph. So there's like a short social network, if you wanna like analyze social networks, see people you might know, that sort of thing, analyze logs and transactions and find patterns that are hidden. Um, you can use it for scientific discovery, like uh, like searching star fields and finding uh, new stars. You can uh, figure out ways to, to improve uh, transportation and use publicly available city data, <coughs> search genomics. And if you go to our, our website right now, this is what it looks like. Uh, we actually replaced all our content for a, for a very short period of time with, uh, with this free, one, one, one free recommender message. And what this is about is though we're a very broad, horizontal uh, platform, we keep hearing people say that they want recommender systems built on top of Mortar. And if you're not familiar with what a recommender system is, is it's, it's an automatic expert system that tries to connect whatever you have to sell or offer to your users. So if you're if any company that has more to offer than one single user can consume can find them useful. So for example, if you're listening to music, you might want to say, okay, there's some music you might like. If you're, if you're a dating service, you might say, these are some dates you might want to go on. If you're offering something for retail, you can sell it. If you're an event service, you can say, these are things you might want to go to, et cetera. It's very, it's very, very broadly useful. Often requires massive computation, somewhat poorly understood, not a lot of code in the open source. So what we're doing right now is building with 10 companies, uh, 10 custom rec recommender systems, and taking all the reusable generic components out of those, open sourcing them, and anything that's custom to your domain or data or code, you own after that. And we're working with these, these data scientists, Hillary, Max, and Drew, to do that, to build really great recommender systems. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with their names. They're, they're some of the badass data scientists of New York. <laughs> and if you're interested, you can just go to our homepage, drop your, your name in the, the want one field, and yeah, if it looks like a fit, we'll be in touch. Okay. There are two ways to use Mortar. Um, I'm, I'm almost to the demo part. Sorry about all this rambling. There are two ways to use Mortar. There's, there's web-only projects, and the value of them are that it takes zero install and you can start using it right away. I'll show this first. And it's totally free to use, except for when you want to actually run in parallel on a massive Hadoop cluster. That has costs because there's actual infrastructure costs underlying that. The second way is a standard Mortar project, which is a local install. Um, it's only one step to install it. 
it's extraordinarily fast because it's using your local machine, and I'll show you some other stuff it's doing with um, using small samples. It allows you to work with multi-file projects, which it becomes a little bit cumbersome if you're working in the web. Uh, it's got a one-button deploy, so even if you've got a very complex data processing job with lots of dependencies and different languages and jars and all kinds of things, it deploys in one button. And it's even freer than the web uh, because if you're using small data sets that can execute on your local machine, it's, it's, you can actually run full-on Hadoop jobs. It installs a whole Hadoop cluster on your, on your machine. And again, you only pay if you need to send your, your, your workload to the cloud <coughs> for execution. Uh, which, by the way, is how so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, dispatch this question. The way that we at Mortar make money is we're a platform as a service. If you want to execute your jobs on our platform as a service, <coughs> then you pay for uh, usage of the platform. Demo. Okay. So, let me move this down a little bit. Can I get this out of the way? Yeah. Okay. So as I said, there's one way to use Mortar, which is directly through the web. And here we go into the code. I think. Yeah. Um, what we're looking at is code that will actually execute on um, on a Hadoop cluster through through Mortar. And what this script does is it takes tweets because everybody likes tweets, and it actually searches for coffee snobbery. So, it, <laughs> so it's looking for words like let's let's go down here and see, uh, espresso, cappuccino, macchiato, latte, cortado, etc. And then, well, I'll just step you through it. But it's basically it's counting the tweets that have them and normalizing by the, the number of tweets per state and telling you what the snobbiest state is. <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm actually going to go through the code a little bit just to show that for those who understand. Um, how to read code, it reads very easily. This, is, this, this language that it's written in is called PIG. It's not proprietary to Mortar. We use open technologies and open tool sets. So the first thing we do is we load our tweets, which happen to be JSON. I won't go into it. You, you can supply a schema or not. In, in this case, we're supplying a schema. The next thing we do is we, uh, we filter out the, all the tweets that we have for places that have, for tweets that actually have a place associated with them. Because we don't have a place, we don't know whether, you know, which state you belong to. The next thing we'll do is for each of the tweets that has a place, we're going to um, do some parsing of the data and uh, determine which state it's in because the, the, the place comes with a city, I think, comma, state name. So we actually do some string parsing. And then here we, we're determining <coughs> is it, whether the tweet's about coffee. So this is now a call out to <coughs> Python. In order, you can use real, um, real Python to do whatever you want to do. So if you use NLTK or NumPy or SciPy, this is a great way to distribute these really sophisticated libraries, or even your own, um, onto Hadoop. So is coffee tweet? It's not very interesting code. Basically, it does a little bit of string parsing, determines whether the, the tweet has any of these uh, phrases up above. <clears throat> then we check to make sure that we actually have a state, group by states, count, divide by the number of tweets we have, Filter out states that have um, that don't have enough enough tweets to be statistically significant or you know close to statistically significant, and um, sort the states and output them. Okay, so it's sort of readable. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with with writing code that runs on Hadoop, oftentimes what you're writing is very backwards. You're using, you're using a paradigm called map, map reduce, and it can be hard to, to write, hard to understand. The point of me talking through that was well, one, it's easy to understand, and then I'm going to come back to those different steps in just a second. So one of the first things we can do that's, that's uh, interesting is we can, we can validate the script. And so what it's doing is it's checking the syntax of pig, it's checking the syntax of Python, and it's actually going and making sure that we can access the data where it's sitting. In this case, I think it's reading from S3. So it's making sure that all our permissions are right. The value of doing this is it saves you a lot of time if you say, okay, this is a script that will actually run, versus, say, if you're running your own Hadoop cluster, you're submitting a job, or if you're running on Elastic MapReduce, you spin up a bunch of uh, machines, Distribute the code, start it executing, and it dies saying, oh, you have a you know, typo. Um, but that's also costly. OK, so project is valid. We've got this little green bar up here. Next thing we can do, which is even more interesting, is actually, I don't want to do that. Um, we can illustrate the script. What this is doing is looking at the, uh, every step of that code that I just went through, taking a big sample of data. Um, actually create a, a direct acyclic graph or a DAG of that execution and try to get full coverage of all that code 
with the data. So it's trying to sample, let me put that in more standard English. Um, what it's trying to do is uh, sample data that will exercise every single execution path you have. So if you have a filter statement, it will try to get um, some data that filters, some that doesn't, so you can see what's happening. And what's happening down here in the Illustrate is each of these um, this tweets, and then as we go down, um, tweets with place. These are the different steps in the pig script above. And what we're looking at is the, 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 the loaded data. Um, and then here we're looking at the loaded data that actually has a place. And so you can see um, sample rows that are coming in and exactly what's happening to them as they progress through the script. Okay, now here's Sierra's mom. Oh, I, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that was going to come up. Um, so here, here's, here's the, the tweets that are coming through. It turns out that in the sample that we were looking for, none of these uh, tweets is actually about coffee. Okay, because we, we, we take a big we take a big sample, but uh, but it's a, it's a best effort algorithm, and if you don't find any that are about coffee, we still want to return, so you're not just waiting forever. <coughs> and so ultimately, it says, okay, well, none of these are about uh, about coffee, and so there's nothing to there's nothing to output. There's a little bit of um, printf style output that's happening here within the Python, which if you've used Hadoop is actually a bigger deal than it sounds like. It's collecting the, the print output from any of you know your 50 or 100 machines that you might be running on. So okay, we you know we either think it's all right or we don't. In this case, I know it's all right. I'm going to show you in a minute how we would be more confident that it actually is doing something, even though it's not finding any coffee tweets. Um, but I'm going to show you how you run. So you run. You want to start a new cluster, okay, let's put it on five machines. And there was uh, some parameterization in the script, so it says, okay, this is where we're going to write to, is this, this output directory, so okay, run. And what's happening is we're actually now, your job has been scheduled to run, you can monitor it status of the job details page. So we've just, I'll just go over to it actually. We're validating the script again before we actually spin up a Hadoop cluster. The next step is going to spin up a Hadoop cluster, distribute the code, get it executing. And I will come back to this at the end of the demo. Um, and hopefully it will, it will be done by that point. I'll be able to show you the output. Um, there's other stuff that I will not show you right now. Um, so what's happening is, oh, I guess I could quickly show it. So what's happening here is we have, we capture a snapshot of the code, yes, five minutes. I'm skipping that. So the, the web, the, uh, the, the web application here does the sort of things you'd expect. It, it snapshots the code you ran with the parameters you ran against what data, where the data ended up, so you can so you can download it in one step. So it's giving you a full history of what you did, how, so you don't lose track of it. Um, it'll be tracking all your logs. If there are errors, which there aren't in the script, it'll point you to exactly where they occurred, how to fix them, slowdowns. It'll it'll highlight them and um, help you fix all that stuff. So. Next, taking inspiration from Rails, which is a web application. Its big uh, contribution, I think, to the field was uh, this idea that, that you could have, a, you should and could have opinions about how things could be structured. And if you did that, well, then there's a lot that we could do for you for free. And as uh, new engineers would come to a project, they'd know where to look for things. We applied these same ideas to data development and, and created a basic project structure that goes along with a local install of mortar on your own machine. So demo of how to run on your own local machine. If you want to install <coughs> mortar at home, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to take the time to, to, to you know, download and install. It's, it's that easy. So it's gem install mortar. Uh, then we, if you want to get code, it's uh, if you want to get somebody else's code, so you're collaborating with them, it's just a matter of you know get clone and the repo name and you, you can pull it down. You can also, just like Rails, auto-generate a skeleton project that can run. I've already done these things. So I'm actually inside of a mortar examples project, which is all in our readme if you want to see these examples. Um, so I'm just going to show you what, we, what they look like. Uh, we have a lot of different um, examples in, in here. So um, this is uh, not my machine. It's got like, way too many examples. Uh, so it's got things in it like airline data and showing you uh, historical information about how which airlines and which uh, locations were particularly slow. It's also got the coffee tweets that we were just looking at. Um, and so this is the same code that we were just seeing. Now running this locally, we can do the exact same things we just saw on, on the web. So rather than type, it's going to be a little quicker. 
So, um, yeah, all right. So you can you can run everything here locally that you could on the web. Order a local, illustrate, coffee tweets. And that warning is actually because I'm going to show you something that isn't isn't actually released to the public yet. Um, so I'm using something that's newer than what you can, than what you can download. Um, and very quickly, we've got the same output with this, this that we saw with Illustrate. And it was much, much faster. I don't know if you noticed, this was about three or four seconds instead of like 15. Cool, very nice. But even better, we can do mortar. This is the part that's not yet quite released. Local watch coffee tweets. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, Light Table, but it's, a, it's an IDE that's very popular on Hacker News right now. Um, where the concept is you should be able to write code and at the same time see exactly what's happening in a separate pane as, as uh, data is flowing through. And um, what we're going to see is we're now watching coffee tweets. And any changes that we make in this script here get immediately reflected over here. In fact, it's currently pointing at, um, at S3, so there, there's a lag as it pulls down data. Let me, let me switch that so it's local. Um, <laughs> file. And because this is a very tiny file, uh, we don't want to limit by the number of, by the states that have five fifty thousand tweets in them. So now we just save that. Oh, there's no tiny tweets file apparently. Yes. Right, did you see this red red up here? So that's like validating for you instantly. Um, what is it actually called? It's called tiny tweet file. So fix that, and just like that, we've now got it's it's flowing through and showing you these tweets, and, and here's apparently a copy tweet. So Dazam, I love macchiato, <laughs> Bahrain, <laughs> uh, and, it, and it counts the states. Okay, apparently in this case that one came from uh, Minnesota, and so it gets 100% of the score. So I guess I don't really have time to show you this, but as you're changing things there, it's, it's immediately being reflected over here, which is a huge deal when you're working with Hadoop and generally working with large data sets. I think I'm probably out of time to show you more. I was going to show um, that once you're working locally, you can do very complicated things like page rank. So you can do iterative uh, algorithms that search for convergence. Um, and just going to show you very quickly how that looks. So you have these, these control scripts um, where you have re reusable algorithms where once you've written page rank, now all you need to do is define these couple things like where your graph data is, your damping factors, convergence thresholds, etc. And then this is actually a driving control script that you as the end user actually don't need to use very much, uh, get, get involved with very much, and it search, searches for convergence um, down in down in here somewhere. Um, the point is, these these are the page rank is an example of a reusable algorithm that is uh, indicative of the ones that we'll be producing as part of our recommender system project that I talked about at the beginning. Okay, I'm gonna cut myself off there. Um, yes. Can you straddle if you have say some in-house infrastructure and also want to use your platform? So the, can you straddle straddle them in sort of a hybrid model? Do you are you saying uh, you have in-house Hadoop cluster and you're using a public cloud Hadoop cluster or just yeah. um, what I would really like is for is for someone to take this local install tool and make it target uh, in-house Hadoop clusters. At the moment, it only targets the mortar uh, platform as a service, but it's actually a very simple set of API calls. So if you're interested in making it, then be able to target yours. That'd be fantastic. And you can do everything right up until execution just on your own box. Yeah. So how many users do you have in who are they kind of profiling the service? Um, so intentionally it's all over the place, maybe even too much, because we're sort of hoping for something to shake out in terms of like, well, this vertical, this size. We are public cloud only, so all of our customers tend to be, you know, from 2007 or later. But they come from all different verticals, all different sizes, several hundred different companies. Yes? Who do you see as your uh, key competitors? There actually aren't that many competitors in this space. So that's to say, 
targeting engineers and data science users uh, to do querying like a SQL-like interface. The closest ones are probably Continuity and Kubel, but you know we are we're certainly distinct from each other in the market. What about the Amazon? The Elastic MapReduce. Yeah. We actually build on top of Elastic MapReduce, and and uh, they're a big fan of what we do. We actually won grand prize at the um, AWS Global International Startup Competition in the big data category a couple months ago. So you're on top of it. Yeah, that's right. That good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you guys. Thanks.